This is Dateline News and Conversation. I have breaking news from Yerevan in Armenia. The situation is not good. People have died, thousands of people fleeing Nagorno-Karabakh, Artsakh, because of an Azerbaijani, Azerbaijani or an Azeri attack on this independent republic. My guest tonight, she's been on the scene in Yerevan. She was even arrested. Natalia Sagian. Natalia, welcome back to the show. Good evening. Okay. Um, Natalia, the big news over the weekend was an attack by the Azeris, Azerbaijan, on the Republic of Artsakh. People yes. were killed. How many? Do you know? How many injured? It was even reported that some Russian peacekeepers were killed. Tell me what happened. On 19th of September, Azerbaijan initiated the so-called anti-terrorist uh, operation in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, in order to uh, maintain its, in, its territorial integrity. Um, the, all this happened because Prime Minister of Armenia declared that he recognizes the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan uh, within uh, 86,800 square kilometers, which included Artsakh and Lachin Corridor that uh, have been claiming themselves independent for the last 30 years, um, because the independence was declared by a referendum and independence was declared from the Soviet Union even before Soviet Azerbaijan uh, declared its independence from the Soviet Union. So as a matter of fact, uh, Artsakh has never been a part of Azerbaijan that we have now. So they have unleashed this anti-terrorist uh, operation. Um, the hypocrisy of all these was that they used the same narrative uh, that the Russian Federation officials are using um, regarding the special military operation in Ukraine. And this definitely was uh, just yet another trap for the Russian Federation uh, because um, no arguments were valid anymore. Because Azerbaijan said, I have to maintain my territorial integrity. And there are separatists and terrorists of Armenian origin there who are uh, not allowing me to establish my constitutional law in uh, the region of Karabakh, as they call it. So it all ended up really badly because they attacked people uh, in, in the villages at the border of Artsakh, between Artsakh and Azerbaijan. Small villages were targeted first. Mm, uh, at the moment, we only know about uh, 100, or a little over 100 uh, casualties. Uh, I mean, the bodies that have been found. Among them, four civilians, uh, among which are two children, uh, which is a, a terrible, it's a tragedy. Um, of course, many people are missing. Many families are, have been split and parents cannot find their children, uh, relatives cannot find each other. So it's a total chaos in Artsakh now. Um, for the first two days on the 20th and the 21st, the border was closed. Uh, but later on, on the 22nd, on the, on the evening on the 22nd, the Lachin Corridor was opened one way so that people can actually flee Artsakh. Uh, and we have received an information at 5 o'clock p.m. Armenian time uh, that 6,650 people already left Artsakh and were moved to Armenia. Uh, all those who have relatives in Armenia... Uh, go to their relatives. Everybody else who has nowhere, no place to stay are now uh, in Goris. It's a town, it's a city in Sunik region where they are all being registered and placed there until uh, Armenian government decides where to place all these people because all these people, they fled with only thing that they were wearing. Nobody has any... Uh, had a chance to take anything with them. And now the, the other people who stayed there still, we can see that people are burning their houses so that uh, Azeris cannot make use of it. And, you know, it's a human tragedy. Because terribly, 
uh, it's violent. How Azeris are treating um, uh, old people who stayed in villages of Martuni, for example, because they had no family and they were just living there all alone and they had no possibility to flee. So uh, we have terrible videos of how Azeri soldiers are treating these people. So this is the situation. 6,650 people already moved to Armenia. There are some 120,000 Armenian Christians living in Nagorno-Karabakh. Yes. You said 6,000 have already fled. What will the remaining people do? Will they stay? If they stay, how will they be treated? And if they return to Armenia, how will Armenia be able to take care of them? It's a big question. Uh, some people already declared, I mean, the uh, figures, political figures of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, almost all of them are participants of the first war for liberation of Artsakh that was in the beginning of the 90s. And they said that they will not leave Artsakh. They were born there and they will continue living there. Uh, all this is happening uh, um, with the background of uh, Azeris. The, the official Baku uh, said that no Azeri army and police will be there until 2025 because the mandate of Russian peacekeepers is till 2025. So apparently, uh, this is the agreement that has been reached that uh, Russian peacekeepers will be uh, situated, placed in Artsakh until the end of their mandate, and then nobody knows what will happen. Uh, returning to your previous question, actually, yes, there were six uh, peacekeepers killed by attack of uh, Azeri armed forces over a, a vehicle of Russian peacekeepers. Uh, where there, there's been a crew of six people, and one of them was a highly ranked Russian officer. Uh, Ilham Aliyev had a telephone conversation with Vladimir Putin and apologized. He also offered a um, financial aid to the families of soldiers killed, uh, which is yet another hypocrisy because no money definitely can replace life of a person. And then there, there, there've been, uh, there's been an information about more attacks on peacekeepers, but this is not confirmed. So I will not give you any numbers, more than six peacekeepers that have been recognized as killed by the Russian side. Now about people in Artsakh. Many people have just no place to go. Uh, and beside that, they just don't want to leave their houses. Because imagine people living in their houses that were built by their grand grandparents. And Armenians have lived in uh, in that land, on that land, for centuries and centuries. Even when Armenia, as Armenia, had no statehood, Artsakh maintained its statehood uh, in a form of several different kingdoms in that region. When Armenia was under Persian or um, Osman or Russian empires, so many people just refused to leave. But what they want to hear is they want to hear guarantees that no Azeri armed forces will be uh, placed in uh, Artsakh whatsoever. At the moment, as I said, we have the information that uh, there will be no Azeri armed forces or police in that region until the end of the mandate of Russian peacekeepers. Uh, about Armenian government, on the, 20, uh, on the 20th of September, Nikol Pashinyan made a, uh, held a speech and he said that according to his information, there is no threat whatsoever for people in Artsakh to continue living there under Azeri control. On that very day, there's been a special meeting of the UN Security Council, uh, where Minister of Foreign Affairs of Armenia, Ararat Mirzoyan, presented the situation as it is, which is very dramatic, uh, and after Mirzoyan finished his speech, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Azerbaijan uh, made his speech, and the only thing that he said was quoting Nikol Pashinyan, saying that, look, Prime Minister of Armenia announced that there is, according to his information, there is no threat for Armenians in Artsakh. So this is a ridiculous situation when two uh, foreign ministers are playing 
a game of a bad policeman and a good policeman, because I'm sure, and many people here in Armenia think that there is an agreement. Uh, so Nicole Pashinyan said that if certain amount of people from Artsakh decide to leave their the land of, you know, he's making a stress in his speech on uh, if they decide to leave the land of their fathers, as like, you know, this is like a victim shaming. It is like not enough that these people lost everything. They lost their land. And now he's shaming them for not wanting to live under Azeri control. And then he said that the Armenian government will probably be able to accept something like 40,000 people. Where are they going to place these people? I don't know. And I think that this is yet another ticking bomb. Because when these 40,000 people come to Armenia, they will definitely need a place to stay. They will need a, a social allowance. They will need, I don't know, all sorts of social security, which will definitely irritate local Armenians. And this is yet another ticking bomb to create more um, antagonism between Armenia Armenians and Artsakh Armenians, which Nikol Pashinyan, being an editor-in-chief of his newspaper, was uh, fueling for many many years and now he officially has a leverage to do that on a state level so we don't know nearly seven thousand people already came to armenia and the process continues as we can see on the picture there are like four or five lines of cars in um, berzor corridor on the way to goris and this um uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, flow of people is not is non-stop so this is the situation at the moment. There have been large protests going on for the last two or three days in Yerevan, the capital. Yes. Um, who, who called for these protests? Did they just happen spontaneously? Uh, what are the people demanding? Uh, the first protest uh, was a, very, a, a truly spontaneous protest on the 19th when we uh, received first information about this attack on Artsakh, people started gathering at the government building. Uh, and this was a truly spontaneous. And there were so many people, like over 10 to 20,000 people that gathered within two hours. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the opposition members also joined the protests later in the evening of the 19th. And I was very surprised to see the people from uh, both camps, pro-Western and pro-Russian. And also people who are somewhere in the middle saying that we want interest of Armenia to be first. Um, so this is, um, we can see the unity of people. And they are all, of, at first, on the 19th and on the 20th, uh, the major demand was, to, for Armenia to take action on protecting Artsakh. But when Nikol Pashinyan made his statement uh, on the 20th, and it became clear that he said that Armenia will not engage. This is the direct text that he pronounced. He said that certain forces outside Armenia and the fifth column inside Armenia want to push Armenia to engage in a full-scale war against Azerbaijan by pro defending Artsakh. Uh, Armenia will not engage. This is what he said. So basically, he abandoned Artsakh completely and allowed, as such, to, uh, to allowed Azerbaijan to unle unleash the ethnic cleansing, which is actually happening now, because this is what is going on. If people are fleeing their homeland, uh, even if it's not under a threat of use of arm or use of force, it is still ethnic cleansing. Uh, today, uh, uh, since the 21st, 22nd, and so on, uh, the opposition uh, protests are demanding resignation of Nikol Pashinyan. Uh, their main argument is that Nikol Pashinyan made some oral promises and he made oral statements also in Prague when he recognized territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, uh, which the new, um, the people who will come after Pashinyan may actually refuse to fulfill because the oral uh, promise or statement uh, can easily be withdrawn. This is their, uh, the plan A. Yes, the first steps that they think they will do if they manage to uh, overthrow Pashinyan and um, organize new elections. So the main uh, 
demand now is resignation of Pashinyan and his cabinet. Um, we will see what happens because protests are continuing. And uh, today from early in the morning, as we can see in the picture, uh, and I was there too, we were uh, closing the streets, blocking the streets all over Yerevan. Uh, the traffic was almost paralyzed. Um, the same was during the afternoon. And, uh, and now uh, a new big relay starts started 15 minutes ago at the Republic Square again. Um, what is remarkable about these protests that a large, very large amount of people, over 25, 30,000 people are gathering every day in the evening at the Republic Square. So it's not dropping. The number of people is not dropping. It's important because it means that people um, are really um, very uh, focused on getting to what they want. They want Pashinyan to resign. I saw some of the photographs and video that, that you sent and that I also found online. Um, the protest appeared to be peaceful, and yet the police and these other, I don't know what they are, special forces with red berets, mm -hmm. look like they are being extremely violent in arresting people who are protesting. Uh, I want you to tell me about that. But you also were arrested. <laughs> yeah. what, what were you doing? We were protesting. We were walking down the street uh, towards a crossroad in the, the downtown Yerevan um, with a goal to block that crossroad for half an hour to um, block the traffic and make our uh, voice heard, etc. Uh, and suddenly, this uh, you know, uh, several six packs of these uh, red berry. Uh, these are special police forces. Yes, um, they came to that crossroad that we were approaching um, and started randomly grab people, mostly men, of course, who were marching with us. And what I was trying to do is, when they started to nearly break hands, you know. I started to tell them, look, what, what are you doing? Why are you being so violent? As if you saw an Azeri or a Turk, why are you treating us like this? We're not your enemies. We are citizens of the same state. Haven't you heard what happened in Artsakh? You know, I was trying to kind of bring them to their senses because they were like, I felt like they were under something. I'm not uh, claiming it now, but I have that feeling because when you look in the eyes of these uh, special forces uh, officers, they really look very strange. Uh, and apparently they were, I don't know, probably um, they were hurt by my words. Their best feelings were hurt when I said that, why are you treating us like we are your enemies? Uh, and the, one of them turned to me and tried to make like physical contact with me. But I said, no, 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 you're not touching me. If you want to detain me and take me to the police department, you have to first tell me why and then show me the car where I have to go. I will go myself. Do not you dare to touch me. So um, I wasn't a victim of a violence, but I was taken to a police department. I was held there for three hours, which is a legitimate time. And they have the right to keep you there for three hours before they uh, like find out who you are, identify you, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have to write a paper. Why were you on the street? But you can also refuse to write a paper and say, I have nothing to explain. This is my civil right. I protest against things that I find wrong. So three hours later, I was uh, let go. But other men who were marching with us, they were held for 72 hours. They are still there. And we have also uh, signals from the Ombudsman of Armenia that violence uh, have been uh, also shown by the police inside the police station. Several people are in hospital. Uh, also, the son of the second president of Armenia, he was arrested. First, he was detained uh, and he was subjected to physical violence in the police car. And he even got a uh, concussion because he was taken to the medical center afterwards. And after the medical center, he was brought back to the police station and the charges were, um, um, he was charged of violence against police officer, which, which is so ridiculous because he was victim of a violence. So uh, he was arrested for one month. That happened yesterday. 
Yes, indeed, police is showing uh, unprecedented violence, even though we saw violence last year during protests in spring last year when we had tents on the on the um, uh, France Square by the Opera House. But this, uh, this violence is really unprecedented because even when people are just walking, they start to randomly grab people and push them into the police vehicles, you know, these special big black vehicles. Actually, they received it as, a, as an aid from the United States uh, and take them to an unknown direction. And then we have to make several phone calls to find out to which police station these people were taken to so that we can send our uh, attorneys there. Um, yes, unprecedented violence. I think that uh, Nicole Pashinyan's regime is really terrified. Do you think there were any outside instigators trying oh, to? Yes. yes. Uh, what were they like? Who, what kind of people were they? Were uh, they we have they identified, first of all, several. Um, they're not police officers, but they are serving. I think they're investigators because they were uh, they were wearing a civilian outfit, so they were not in a police uniform. Uh, but we have identified them. We have uh, spread their uh, pictures all uh, around the Armenian segment of the Internet. And some people recognize them. So we now know their names and we know where they work. Uh, and these people were coming to our protest and shouting, um, you know, bad-mouthing police officers to make them even more angry. And of course, some people were supporting them, saying, yes, yes, they're all, I I'm sorry, I will not repeat what they were saying. Uh, not only that, some of them were um, provoking violence by uh, shouting out things like Russia is our enemy uh, or the West is our enemy, depending on uh, by which group of people they were standing. So they were definitely, if they found themselves standing by a more Russia-oriented people, they started shouting that Russia is our enemy, uh, firing a, a, a reaction, as we can expect, yes? And when they started fighting between each other, police forces immediately attacked them all, grabbed them all, and took them all to the police department. And this is what they're trying to do to uh, make people afraid, uh, so that people do not come to the everyday rally. Because every day at 6 o'clock, uh, we have rallies at the Republic Square. And they hope that maybe one day they will get less people and then less and less and less. But this is not happening. They're not succeeding. Okay. Um, you mentioned Russia. Um, and we have talked about this before in the past. Russia has peacekeepers there. Russia has a very long standing relationship and a defense treaty with Armenia. The Prime Minister Pashinyan made a statement yesterday or today saying we're done with Russia. Russia yes. has not done enough to protect us. <clears throat> we are now moving towards the United States and the West. And we even want to join the International Criminal Court which is the court that wants to arrest President Putin. Yeah. How, how aware are the thousands of people who have been protesting that Pashinyan wants to split with Russia and go to the West? Do the people favor this? I mean, I can't imagine they are if they're calling for his resignation. Uh, of course, the majority of protesters are uh, not in favor of this, of course. They are protesting against these two. Because we all understand that Pashinyan, when Pashinyan says that um, the security architecture that Armenia has built and maintained during the last 30 something years, and that was uh, Russia centered, uh, is not showed itself as a non effective one. So Armenia has to think about changing its uh, security architecture. This is literally what he said. This basically means that we have to say goodbye to Russia and maybe even withdraw from the, the, the treaty organization, the Odekabe, as they call it in Russian. 
uh, and probably turn towards NATO. But the thing is that nobody is waiting for Armenia in the, in the NATO. We never received any, uh, I don't know, we didn't apply and we never received any invitation or even an implication that we may apply because Armenia needs to fall into certain standards before it can even apply. So this is a, you know, this is a utopia. Of course, it's not going to happen. Um, and Pashinyan knows it perfectly and his Western uh, puppet masters know it perfectly uh, because their goal is to push Russia out of the region and to make Armenia a, um, a proxy polygon against Iran and Russia. This is obvious. Now, people who are protesting in the street, they know it all, and they know that this international criminal court, um, you see, Pashinyan uh, said a big lie here. He said that we want to ratify the Roma statute because it will help us. It will help us to bring Azerbaijan to uh, justice for all the, the you know war crimes that Azerbaijan committed against people of Armenia and Artsakh, which is stupid. Um, it may seem stupid unless we understand that Pashinyan knows exactly that Azerbaijan never admit or never recognized um, the jurisdiction of this court over Azerbaijan. So this is a very naive point of view to think that if we ratify the Roma statute, it will give us any leverage or it will it will serve us as any sort of tool against Azerbaijan. This is a total lie, a straightforward lie, because Pashinyan knows exactly that it's it's not going to happen. The only thing that why is he raising this issue about the Roma statute is to um, you know, this is a message to Vladimir Putin directly. Uh, I, uh, today, uh, the Russian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs had made a very uh, blunt statement, uh, which actually was, it, it really was a, an unprecedented strict statement addressing Pashinyan's uh, recent uh, several speeches that he made within these few days. Of course, Russia uh, doesn't accept any accusations from the Armenian side regarding what happened in Karabakh, particularly after Erdogan, the president of Turkey, saying that Nikol Pashinyan was personally informed about plans of Azerbaijan to start an anti-terrorist operation in Karabakh. So he knew what's going to happen and did nothing. Even though Azeri's official Baku said that he also informed Russian peacekeepers uh, but Mr. Peskov from Kremlin said that the Russian peacekeepers were informed like 20 minutes before the actual operation started. So this is yet another manipulation. But Pashinyan was informed several days ago and did nothing. So all his accusations um, to Russia for what happened in Karabakh are absolutely groundless. Uh, and of course, in this statement of the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, it stated that um, Armenia, uh, instead of working uh, consistently with Russia and Azerbaijan, in accordance with a statement signed by uh, the trilateral statement um, of the 9th of November of 2020, uh, Armenia um, chose to, you know, make the zigzag movements between Russia and the West, Russia and the West. And this is the outcome. This is what happens when you are trying to keep sitting on two chairs, when the moment to make a decision and to choose side already it has come already. So Pashinyan thought that probably he can compete with Erdogan on this because Erdogan is a master of this, you know, sitting on several chairs. But Pashinyan is not um, qualified enough, you know, to do that. He doesn't even have a university degree. So uh, the situation is really very bad. Yes, what we can see here, especially judging from uh, very, very active visits of uh, all sorts of people from the United States, uh, from, for example, a Demo Demo um, Democrat senator from Michigan, um, Gary Peters, came to Yerevan three days ago. Uh, the day before yesterday, he visited Kornizor and he stayed there yesterday. Today, he met Pashinyan and he said that the U.S. is supporting Armenia and all the blah, blah, blah that they usually say. 
Um, Madam Samantha Power is also in Armenia, the USAID officer in charge of the USAID. And uh, Madam Yuri Kim uh, is also in Armenia. She is a highly ranked uh, State Department official. Uh, who has actually served as, as an ambassador of the US, the U.S. in Albania, which is also, I think, a remarkable detail. Um, and the fact that they all came here after everything already happened, uh, when uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks they were calling for Azerbaijan to open Lachin Corridor and Azerbaijan ignored it, uh, we can say that uh, they are here simply to give our mid Prime Minister Pashinyan, more money and more money and more money to maintain his pro-Western orientation and uh, to place all these displaced people so that uh, no new wave of riots raises in Armenia. Because all these people from Artsakh, uh, they will not sit still because they've lost their fatherland, which their grand-grandfathers lived on for centuries. And just because one traitor, uh, as Pashinyan is, they have lost their fatherland. So Pashinyan is very afraid of all these people coming to Armenia. Now, I'm sure that what he wants from the West, he also wants a lot of money to probably build, I don't know, uh, temporary shelters for these people or to provide them with all sorts of support so that they do not um, protest against him. Um, this is... Uh, this is all I can say at the moment because I don't know what are Samantha Powers and the other lady talking about with Pashinyan. No information about it so far. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Turkey. Mm -hmm. Turkey has been supporting and encouraging Azerbaijan yes. to take back Nagorno Karabakh. Mm -hmm. Turkey is not the only country involved. You and I have talked about this before. Um, Israel is involved mm -hmm. because Iran is involved yes. and Russia is involved. This is kind of a, a very intricate and I think dangerous yes. combination mm -hmm. that, that could soon explode. Are any people concerned about this <laughs> in Armenia? Uh, because I am. What I see happening is the United States is behind all of this. Yes. We've talked about this before with their soft power and their hard power. They are behind the trouble in, in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. They are behind right now, uh, close to war in yes. Serbia and Kosovo. On top of that, they're in Ukraine and in mm -hmm. the Taiwan Straits. So what we're seeing is these same players are creating chaos, conflict, and really death wherever yes. they go. Are yeah. people aware of this? I know you are, but those thousands of people that are coming out and protesting, are they aware of who these global players are? Uh, here we have uh, a situation which is uh, not so good because um, the U.S. had uh, sponsored mass media for decades in Armenia. So they have their pocket mass media, um, which is uh, spreading all sorts of pro-Western, pro-U.S. information everywhere from every i don't know from every device you can hear 85 90 percent pro pro us pro western information and very little serious analysis that would uh show that our who are uh, our true allies and friends turkey being a nato member state and being very much dependent on uh, its Western allies, uh, because Turkey is allowed to do many things because it serves as uh, a uh, as a tool to do the dirty job for NATO and for the collective West. 
anywhere they need the dirty job to be done. This is why the West is tolerating Turks having occupied Cyprus, half of the Cyprus, since 74. This is why the West is tolerating Turkey doing things that it does in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, and anywhere Turks poke their noses to. So, yes, indeed, Turkey supports Azerbaijan all along the way because they say we are one nation, two states. The major goal, the paradigm, we can say, of Erdogan in the South Caucasus is to push Russia out to gain control over the South Caucasus uh, because uh, through this, he will allow its ally Israel to base in the South Caucasus and start provoking Iran. Because the, the West as such, a collective West, has two major goals here, to push Russia out of the region and to start um, actions against Iran. And even and now they are in a hurry because I think they, they see that Iran is building up new healthy relationship with the Arab world, with Syria, with even with Yemen and with Egypt and many other countries uh, southward from Iran to secure its south borders. Uh, and as we can see on the map that I've um, sent you, Turkey and Azerbaijan want to break through three corridors through the territory of Armenia to connect mainland Azerbaijan with an exclave of Nakhichevan, which is also part of Azerbaijan, but it doesn't have a uh, land border with Azerbaijan. Only one little part of border with Turkey, which was previously Iran, but Iran and Turkey um, exchanged territories. Iran gained control over two little islands in the um, Persian Gulf that belonged to Turkey. And Turkey got this very, very small strip of land that would serve to uh, as, as a border between Turkey and Nakhichevan. So what they want to do is they want to break a, uh, they get a three corridors ex-territorial, which means that Armenia will have no control over these corridors. And Turks and Azeris will control these corridors through the territory of Armenia, which will actually divide Armenia into three parts and will make it easier for them to swallow it like, like a, it's, a, it's called the salami principle. When you slice by slice, cut territories from a country and, you know, swallow it. This is their plan because what they want to do is want, they want to erase Armenia off the map because it's on their way to the great Turan that they want to establish, create. And the West is helping them on that because we all know how it works. And Israel has, as, as you mentioned, uh, has its own interest here. They already have, have two military bases uh, on the territory of Artsakh, which is now occupied by Azerbaijan. One of them is in Fizuli. This is a city that was uh, populated by Armenians and now it's occupied by Azerbaijan. So they have built a big airport there, presented it as a civilian airport when they cut the red, red ribbon and everything. And afterwards, it started serving as a military airport where uh, continuously uh, airplanes, military airplanes flowing, flying in from Israel to that airport are coming. And there, there is an Israeli military base where Israelis are location, located and they are monitoring Iran from there. Uh, what is also disturbing Iran very much is the EU observer mission that Pashinyan allowed to come to Armenia, and now they have two headquarters, one in Sunik, which is a region uh, that borders with Iran directly, and one in Yeregnador. Uh, this is a region that borders with Nakhichevan. What is this EU, EU mission doing in Armenia? Nobody knows, because so many attacks were from Azerbaijan to Armenian territory during this uh, last month, and strangely, these EU observers never witnessed anything. And this happened before, because they report about their routes to official Baku beforehand. So Baku knows where to strike, where there are no European observers there. But this is not really a EU mission because now they have already Canadians, representatives from Canada. So this is just a Western 
uh, a group of Westerners, and uh, almost all of them have military background. So they're not just people from the street. They're not diplomats. They're all former military uh, officials who are now stationed in two headquarters in south of Armenia, one at the border with Iran and one at the border with Nakhichevan. This is definitely not just an accident. So if re these three corridors happen because of these uh, hostile narratives that we hear from Erdogan, uh, for example, several weeks ago, Erdogan, uh, several days ago, when Erdogan made a speech at the UN, he said that the corridor is a matter of several months. A day before yesterday in the morning, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey uh, said that the corridor is a matter of days. When we have such shift in narratives, this is not uh, just a coincidence. This is not an accident. These people don't say a word without a reason. So this means, and today Erdogan is visiting Nakhichevan. He is now in Nakhichevan. So and we know from legitimate sources, and Turkey is not hiding it, that they have accumulated significant military force on the border of Nakhichevan and Armenia. Mostly tanks. Tanks will not go to south of Armenia to climb mountains. Tanks use roads. And roads from there lead directly to Yerevan. So if a tank moves with a speed 60 kilometers per hour from Yerask, which is a border city to, with Nakhichevan, there are 60 kilometers. I think no comment on that yet. Yeah. Uh, it's a very tense situation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to know from you, who you've been on the street, uh, every day, every night, um, you're a member of the opposition party, one of the opposition parties. Uh, are, uh, two questions. Are the opposition parties united? Are you arguing the same thing in this particular issue? Yes, we are um, arguing the same thing, but I wouldn't say that the opposition is united. Uh, opposition party has its own uh, recipe on how to deal with Pashinyan. One part of them want to impeach him, which is nearly impossible with uh, the parliament that we have today, because the, the Pashinyan's party has a constitutional majority. And to impeach him, we need to first have a candidate for a vice president and certain number of votes which opposition doesn't have in the parliament. So this is an utopia. And the other uh, part of the opposition is more radical. And they say that if Pashinyan took power by breaking to the, the, the state radio uh, building, breaking into the government building, breaking, in, breaking into the national assembly, the parliament building, then the only way to overthrow him is through that. But this will probably not be a very legitimate way to do that. Uh, the, the, other, the, uh, the third uh, part of the opposi opposition thinks that unless there is a consensus outside Armenia about overthrowing Pashinyan or replacing him with somebody else, uh, nothing can, no political process can succeed in Armenia, especially when the population underneath these processes is very divided. Because we hear all these nice speeches from Washington, how Bob Menendez is saying, oh, poor people of Artach, we have to help them. Macron is on, on the other hand, the president of France is saying, we stand by Armenian nation and no sanctions against Azerbaijan at the same time. But all these pro-Western um, quotes are being spread so widely by the Western uh, financed mass media, that people are expecting something which is never going to happen. The West has never helped Armenia. Same, exactly the same thing happened 100 years ago during the, the, this Bolshevik revolution in Russia, when Armenia was given certain promises by the uh, trilateral um, union of US, France, and uh, UK, 
that they will help Armenia to maintain lands that Russian imperial army uh, liberated from Turkey. And at the same time, when, when we were given these promises, the Bolshevik revolution happened. So the, the Bolsheviks came to Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan was Sovietized before Armenia was. And when Armenia was still considering, because we received these uh, nice promises from the West, we were hesitating. This is how Karabakh appeared to be a part of Azerbaijan, because Armenia hesitated because of these nice promises. But they didn't send us one single bullet. And we lost a huge territory of 40,000 square kilometers and entered Soviet Union with 29.8 thousand kilometers, square kilometers. Same thing is happening now. We didn't see one single bullet. We don't need your promises. Give us one bullet and we will know that you truly support us. But this is not going to happen. Unfortunately, today we're fighting a hybrid war, uh, which is on the ground, is uh, driven by information. Uh, when Russia is not really using any of soft power tools to do this, and this segment, which is more, well, I wouldn't say we're pro-Russian, but we understand that Armenian interests today in South Caucasus coincide with interests of Russia in South Caucasus. This is why we are being labeled as pro-Russians and, you know, gubernians, because they think that we want Armenia to become a part of Russia. No, nothing like this. But we think that we have to use any all possible um, allies that we have. We have to work properly with Russia and Iran. And our voice is not being heard because we do not have enough uh, resources to do that. We cannot compete with the soft power and all the money that's coming from the USAID. Uh, they issued a new trench of uh, 17 millions and then 20 millions, all this only this year for development of independent mass media in Armenia, like what we had already wasn't enough. How can we compete with them? We cannot compete with them. So people in the street are expecting help from Macron, from Bob Menendez, from I don't know who, when people in America, like at the screenshot that I've sent you, the, the, um, the ANCA, that is the Union, uh, Armenian Union in the United States, which is a very powerful diaspora organization that's been you know, pushing forward the genocide recognition issue. They have directly blamed Joe Biden for what's happening in Karabakh now. Because Joe Biden did nothing. But I don't think that Joe Biden is, um, I don't know, I don't know if he realizes what's happening around him. <laughs> but <laughs> this is the problem. The population under these political um, processes is very divided. So, Natalia, what do you think is going to happen with these protests continuing? Will the government just use excessive force to stop them completely? Yes. What do you think will happen? Is that what you think will happen? Uh, the several uh, talking heads from Pashinyan's party, people who are um, parliament uh, members, people who are even the speaker of the parliament today made a statement when a journalist asked him a question about excess use of force by the police, he said that they're doing everything right because these people who are in the street, they are not representing interests of Armenia and they are being um, instructed by uh, certain forces in Russian Federation. Just listen to this narrative. Now, they, they've already claimed several times during these last few days that there is, um, uh, they have legitimate concern that there is a coup being prepared against Pashinyan uh, from Russian Federation. Just listen to this narrative. Do you think there's any truth to that? I don't think so, really, because um, I don't see any signs of it. Yeah, if, what, if something like this is happening, then there is a huge conspiracy because there's no sign of it in the field whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm thinking that what, protests will continue, but if the opposition fails to unite yeah. around one approach on how to uh, overthrow Pashinyan, they will not succeed. Yeah. 
What, and Pashinyan you... will stay in power till 26. The next parliamentary elections is uh, are in 26. So what do you think the Russian Federation will do? The peacekeepers are going to be there. I mean, I, I don't know how they can be very effective for another three years till 2026, 2025. I think 2025. Um, what do you think Russia's position is on all of this? I haven't read anything, really. Well, uh, Russian position is the following. Since Pashinyan uh, recognized territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, uh, so Karabakh is Azerbaijan, and the position of Russian peacekeepers has become very shaky because of that. But since there is a document signed that uh, the mandate of peacekeepers uh, is still 25, and Azerbaijan is not pushing forward, from for, for now is not pushing forward this issue, that what are you doing here? If this is my sovereign territory, and Armenia is not arguing that, then what Russian peacekeepers are doing there? So Russian peacekeepers will stay there uh, under constant threat that Azerbaijan and Turkey will raise this issue. Um, hopefully, they will manage to maintain some peace there for people who decide to stay. But in two years, many things may happen. Um, I would like to think, I would like to believe that uh, Russia has a plan of which we're not aware. Uh, this is my sincere hope. Uh, for the moment, what we see is a big criticism uh, of Pashinyan, um, but the problem here is that when they're criticizing Pashinyan, uh, they are also blaming the entire Armenian nation, which is creating a very bad backlash here in Armenia. Because not, uh, you know, Pashinyan was elected in 1000, 2021, not by the majority of people who had the right to vote. Only 48% of electorate actually took part in those parliamentary elections. And he took 51% of that 48%, uh, if, if I make myself clear. So um, there are around 2 million, well, 1 million 800 something people who have a right to vote. And only, only 600,000 people gave their vote to Pashinyan. So he doesn't really represent Armenia. And now when we look at his rating, it's below 14%. The recent wait, election... Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. wait, 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 wait. Below yes. one, four, 14? One, one, four, one, four, 14. Oh, boy. And this has happened in two and a half years. He lost his rating. The recent municipality elections in Yerevan that uh, uh, that took place on 17th of September last week, Pashinyan's party gained 9.1%, which is nothing. 9.1% in the capital city, which traditionally votes for the party in power. So this is a very dramatic situation for him. And he knows that if he runs another parliamentary elections now, unless he fakes it or he uses uh, administrative resource, which they also did in Yerevan, but they didn't succeed whatsoever. But there is another crisis in Yerevan elections too, because there are five political parties that um, uh, took enough votes to actually be represented in the munip municipality two pro-Pashinyan parties and three oppositional parties. But three oppositional parties uh, are not uh, ready to unite. This is the problem. If even when Pashinyan's rating is so low, nobody of the opposition leaders has a rating even near to Pashinyan. Nobody exceeds him in, in the rating. You know, this is our problem. This is why opposition has very little chance to win. Okay. Uh, to me, this is obviously a very combustible, explosive mm -hmm. situation. Uh, you meant, mentioned Samantha Powers and others from the United States 
landed in Yerevan today. Uh, so all of these powers that we've been talking about are getting involved in this. Yes. And, and the protests you claim are going to continue. Uh, I hope the violence doesn't continue. But we have to keep tabs on what's happening with the refugees. 6,000, yeah. more than 6,000 already fleeing. You know, that still leaves over 112,000 somewhat people who are still there. How many more of them will leave? I mean, this could create an enormous humanitarian crisis beyond what already existed in the Gordon yeah. Karabakh. Yes. Natalia, I can't thank you enough. We've been in contact every day. Um, and I hope that if there's anything big that happens, we can bring you back for a special report. Yeah, with pleasure, of course. It's important for the world to know what's happening. 